Hi everyone, this is going to be your lecture on drugs as it relates to altered states of consciousness. We will be discussing psychoactive drugs. A psychoactive drug is going to be any drug that activates on the mind, a chemical substance that can alter your perception of the world, your mood, or your behavior. Most adults and young adults regularly take psychoactive drugs, the most common being caffeine. The other two, nicotine or alcohol, are very common in our culture. Psychoactive drugs interfere with normal neurotransmission. So again, they activate within the neural system. They bind better and stay attached to receptor sites longer than the normal neurotransmitters, and that can intensify the signal and the body's way of processing and responding to those signals. We've talked about agonist, antagonist, and neurotransmitters. Well, psychoactive drugs act as agonists. They mimic a neurotransmitter and they send a message. They can also block a receptor site and inhibit a message, or they can block the process reuptake and prevent neurotransmitters from returning back to their sending neuron, keeping them in the synapse and resending their message. Chemical substances alter your state of consciousness, but they can also lead to dependence, a state of physiological, but also possibly psychological need to take more and more of the substance as they continue to use it. Dependence is not the same as addiction. Addiction has to disrupt a person's ability to function everyday life. So I can easily say I have a caffeine dependence in the morning. I feel like I kind of need a cup of coffee to get my day going. Part of that is psychological. It's part of my routine and I think that I need it. And some of it is physiological. I will get a headache after prolonged use of using caffeine in the morning. So I kind of do it so I don't get a, a headache until I kind of detox off of the caffeine. This is kind of my morning. I wake up grumpy and tired and one cup of coffee makes me feel like I'm kind of balanced and feeling better. And by my second cup of coffee, I'm sunshine and roses. Now, while this is not the same as addiction, during the summer, I get to sleep in later. And after about a week or so, I don't really want to have coffee in the morning. But on those days where I think I'm not getting a lot of sleep, my first go-to thing is make a cup of coffee. So as much as it can be physical, in my case, it's also often very psychological. Withdrawal is the discomfort that you get when you come off of a drug that you have developed dependence on. So since school has started, I drink roughly two cups of coffee every morning. Um, I do it because I like coffee, but my body is also getting really used to having the caffeine. So on the weekends, if I don't have a cup of coffee, I do feel sluggish. I feel a little cranky. I get a little bit of a headache. In fact, all of the things that the caffeine is undoing, the withdrawal is exasperating. So the symptoms often resemble the opposite of the drug's intended effect. I stop drinking coffee in the mornings and I feel groggy and have headaches. Tolerance is when your responsiveness to the psychoactive drug decreases because you've essentially gotten used to it. You've learned to tolerate. Your body needs more of that drug to get kind of the original response. Withdrawal is worse for those who have a long history of drug use or regular use. As the tolerance increases, more and more of the drug is needed to feel the same kind of response. This can become incredibly dangerous when we're talking about other drugs later on. The five categories that we'll talk about rather quickly, depressants, opiates, stimulants, hallucinogens, and marijuana. Now note that as we're talking about this every day, every year, new research comes up with brand new information about these drugs, about the consequences, about the risks. So for what you're getting right now, well, it's kind of locked in time. It's what we know right now. Normally in class, we would watch Ryan's story. Most people think of alcohol as a social drink and not even really a drug. But having recently lost a family member to alcoholism, not drunk driving, but a lifetime of alcoholism, which destroyed his brain, I show students this story because you can see the profound impact that alcohol can have on a mind, on a body, and what it really does when we talk about someone who's truly addicted. Alcohol is a depressant. Depressants are a category of drugs that reduce neural activity and slow body functioning. Now the question always is then why do people act crazy when they're drunk? Well, it inhibits the frontal cortex of the brain and that's the area of the brain that regulates decision-making, good behavior, emotional regulation. It actually slows that area down. It's the second most uh, used psychoactive drug in the world 
right behind caffeine, which is kind of a scary thing. It slows thinking, impairs physical activity, so we all know that you shouldn't drink and drive because it impairs our ability to respond in a timely manner. And beverages tend to vary widely in the amount of alcohol that they contain. So everything that you see in front of you should have roughly the same alcohol um, content, but if you go and get a drink, you really, it's drink specific. Men typically have 50% more of an enzyme responsible for metabolizing alcohol meaning that they rid themselves of alcohol faster. Pound for pound, they have more blood in their vascular system, so alcohol tends to be more diluted. And a higher percentage of body fat in women tends to concentrate more alcohol in blood plasma than it does in men, which raises the blood alcohol content in women. Now this doesn't mean that men should go out and drink 50% more, but what it does mean is that biology is really, really important when it comes to consuming narcotics, drugs, um, psychopharmaceuticals, pick whichever term you would like, but your biology matters. And so ladies, a drink will, ch will hit your system far different than it will hit a male system. And a man that is much larger will deal with alcohol differently than a man that's much smaller. A man with more body fat will deal with alcohol differently than a man with very little body fat. Know your bodies and understand that you're dealing with something that can very much impact how you react to your surroundings. So again, it's not equal when we're looking at men and women and how a single drink will impact us. You guys are of driving age and soon in the next maybe five to seven years will probably be of drinking age. Be careful, just understand that it's not a competition and that it really is very important that if you are going to operate a piece of machinery that can take someone's life in the blink of an eye, that you are aware of what you are doing when you do it. The legality of alcohol and other drug possession usually seems to come up in class just because of my background. Well, in the state of Virginia, the blood alcohol content for a person to be considered intoxicated while driving is 0.08. If you're under the age of 21 and operating a vehicle, it's 0.02. And to be charged with possession, it's anything. But here's the big thing. Possession doesn't mean in your hand or on your pocket or in your back seat. It can mean on your breath and in your body. So as teens, you guys can't possess any of it and it cannot be in your system. The area of the brain that's most affected by alcohol is the prefrontal cortex. Now alcohol increases the probability that a person will act out. Any of the inappropriate and dangerous urges is that they usually kind of keep in check while sober. It impairs your memory. So even if you think you're being safe, if you don't know how it impacts you, you might not remember stuff. And I will tell you, not having a memory of something you did is very, very disturbing. It suppresses the processing of recent events into long-term memory. So there's no such thing as a functional or a good alcoholic. Alcohol use always comes with consequences. Any experience that is done in an intoxicated state might not transfer to the sober state. So you might remember it while intoxicated, but when you become sober, you may no longer have access to the neural connections that made up that memory. Alcohol disrupts REM sleep and that actually further disrupts your ability to remember because we just talked about in your sleep dreams and body rhythms that you need REM to help remember. We would normally get into a much deeper conversation about what all this means if we were in class and it, it's kind of hard to have this conversation without being able to really kind of engage you in the discussion about what you think. But it is important to note that all of the combined yearly deaths from all illegal drugs and substances is less than that of alcohol each year. Half of all the beer, wine, and liquor consumed in the country is consumed by 10% of the population. 50% of what's consumed is consumed by 10% of the population. That's insane. And many of those people are considered alcohol dependent. So when we talk about alcohol dependence, that means that these aren't people who can quit alcohol cold turkey. And in fact, alcohol is the only drug that you may actually need to do step down withdrawal from, that you may not be able to just completely go cold turkey and stop taking the drug altogether if you're alcohol dependent. Now, please understand that means if you are alcohol dependent, your body has become reliant upon the drug. We'll talk to you guys about drinking on college campuses. The only cautionary thing that I will say to you is understand how this impacts your brain. And I don't mean brain damage or anything else, 
but your decision making. When you drink alcohol, you stop thinking about consequences. You stop thinking about other people. You start to become rather self-focused and you do worry about not getting in trouble. The reason I bring this up is that it is okay to be very cautious about your drinking because you don't trust the people around you, even if they are your best friends. Because when people start to drink, they worry about their aspirations, about their futures, and they may f feel less inclined to go out of limb and protect a friend of theirs that may have drank too much. They may decide that their friend could sleep it off instead of taking them to the emergency room to ensure that they're not dying. So just kind of keep that in mind, that the fear of getting in trouble often prevents really well-intentioned people from helping others who should be going to the hospital and seeking help. Opiates are the next drug that we're going to talk about in the classification of depressants. We currently have a true issue or epidemic surrounding opiate use in this country. Now, when we're talking about it, there are illegal opiates like heroin, but then there are prescription ones like oxycodone and morphine. And it's with the prescription drugs that we seem to be having this increased issue. And there's people that will come and look at it from a couple of different vantage points, but one of them is the overprescription of painkillers. We'll read opiate overdose in class, and that way you guys can have a pretty good understanding of how opiate overdose can actually cause a death, and maybe a little more understanding as to why we continue to use opiates in this country. Opiates depress neural activity, which makes them a depressant, and they also temporarily lessen pain and anxiety. Now, I've had neck surgery, rotator cuff surgery, um, those sort of things, and I have been prescribed painkillers, um, and usually it's oxycodone. Now, I count myself lucky because when I take that, it makes me itch like crazy, and I can't sleep, so I don't like taking it, which means that I really try to restrict any of my painkiller use that I've ever had coming off of any of my surgeries, but I'm also really, really freaked out about addiction. So again, it's just another reason for me to sit there and say I don't need to take it. Morphine, we're familiar with this. It's been around since the Civil War. And again, this is an active ingredient in opium, and it's a really strong sedative, and it's really good at relieving pain. And it is still used in hospitals today. But the side effects, well, euphoria and relaxation. If you've just had a major surgery and you're in incredible amounts of pain, euphoria and relaxation isn't that bad. Tolerance does develop. The more often you use an opiate, the more of that opiate you will need to feel that euphoria and that relaxation, which is why doctors are really, really reluctant to renew any kind of pain medicine prescriptions. Heroin's withdrawal symptoms include about a week's worth of intense pain. And when I say intense pain, think overall body cramping. It happens to also be accompanied with hyperventilation, this feeling of not being able to breathe, very deep bouts of depression, high blood pressure, and if that doesn't stop you, explosive diarrhea. Because nothing is better than turning your house into a fecal Jackson Pollock painting. So when we're looking at something like that, the withdrawal symptoms are pretty intense and pretty painful. But that's also a reason why some people have a hard time going through the withdrawal is the intense pain that is associated with it because as you take heroin or oxycodone or morphine, you are replacing the natural endorphins that your brain produces to help you deal with pain. You're taking in a altered or a synthetic version and so you don't have the natural painkillers that your body makes to help you deal with the withdrawal symptoms. Thousands die due to overdose trying to avoid withdrawal symptoms. They take so much of this drug that they stop breathing. It depresses their ability to breathe. It's a terrifying, terrifying thing. So how does something like morphine work? Well, it prevents pain signaling neurons from firing or releasing pain signaling neurotransmitters from being released. It stops the pain message, but the damage is still there. The body is still got the broken ankle or the torn muscle but the message never reaches the brain. The morphine mimics endorphins, those pain-blocking neurotransmitters. 
Stimulants are the next category of drugs that we'll talk about. And the first one that we'll talk about is the most common stimulant that people use, which is caffeine. Stimulants excite neural activity and speed up body function. Caffeine, again, like I just said, most widely used stimulant. 80% of US adults consume some form daily, and I am definitely one of them. Caffeine blocks the chemical adenosine. Adenosine helps us feel tired and drowsy. So by blocking it, we don't get that tired, drowsy feeling. Caffeine is going to be found in chocolate and colas and, and in my favorite, coffee. Regular caffeine produces a tolerance and a dependence. Now, I drink like one or two cups a day, and then maybe in the evening I might have a caffeinated tea, but I try to limit it to just coffee in the morning. Now, my mom used to drink a entire pot of just straight black coffee, and we would know the days where she didn't have our coffee because she would have really intense headaches, she'd be agitated, and she'd be more tired than normal. So there are definite withdrawal symptoms from caffeine. It's not a drug without consequence. In fact, there is no such thing as a drug without consequence. The intensity of the withdrawal is directly related to the normal amount of caffeine that's taken in each day. And so every once in a while, just to kind of keep myself from getting too used to coffee, I'll sometimes switch up and do decaf. I like to throw this in there just because a lot of us are coffee drinkers and plus it makes me feel better about my coffee drinking. Now when they say four cups, I'm not sure if they mean eight ounces to equal a single cup or if it's like me where a cup is just huge and I do two huge cups. Well, we'll figure out later maybe. But some of the fun things, four cups of coffee a day reduces the chances of getting type 2 diabetes by 50%. I don't know why, it just apparently does according to what they're relaying to us. Uh, people who drink three to five cups of coffee per day will never forget this fact. 65% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And again, I don't know why, but it's a fun little fact to put in your back pocket when you're downing that you know, cup of Starbucks. A study of 130,000 people, who those who reported drinking one to three cups of coffee per day were 20% less likely to suffer from abnormal heart rhythms. Um, and again, it doesn't matter what you're drinking. When they're talking about coffee, they're not talking about all the cream and the sugar and everything else that's kind of dumped into it. They're really talking about just straight up coffee. It's just the quantity that I'm not 100% sure of. But again, I told you guys I love my coffee. I like my coffee with just a little bit of cream, um, no sugar whatsoever. So I feel like I'm pretty okay and that I might be benefiting a little bit from this. Or at least I try to re remind myself that maybe I am. We will be looking at the issue of addiction in class. Is addiction a social issue or is it a biological issue? Well, many of you already have an idea of how you feel or believe you should answer this question. What I'm gonna ask you to do is withhold your judgment until you look at the science behind both of these videos and then use them to maybe help inform how you would answer your question. Another stimulant that we'll talk about is nicotine and nicotine is found in tobacco it's extremely addictive and it doesn't stay in the body very long and it works with dopamine and they think that maybe dopamine is telling you to remember the behavior and so you light back up again because you want to feel that rewarding behavior that is associated with dopamine. This might explain why people who smoke light up so frequently. Even though I thought smoking was a thing of the past, 6,000 teens will light up for the first time daily a thousand of those will die from smoking related diseases. Now, I grew up with a father who is a respiratory therapist and then went to go work at NIH in their respiratory department. And I grew up with pictures of black tar filled lungs. Um, I don't smoke, it freaks me out. Nearly 45,000 smokers will die in the US this year alone because of tobacco use. Now, some of you are gonna tell me, okay, but then there's vaping. Well, the problem with vaping is that the moisture particles, even if it is non-nicotine related, actually start to form a gummy substance in your lungs and you can get very sick from this kind of almost mucousy gum that forms in your lungs. Anytime you introduce yourself to any substance that isn't food or water, and even with food, too much sugar can be bad, but anytime you introduce yourself to a chemical substance that you're not normally supposed to interact with, you're taking a risk, and that's just how it works. However, due to a lot of smoking campaigns, there has been a 90% decline in adult use over the past 35. This should feel weird, because it even feels weird to me, and no, I didn't live during the 60s, and I was born at the very end of 1978, so even that one's a little weird, but 
the fact that you had a professional athlete promoting smoking in the 60s, that just is crazy. And then you get into the 70s and there's this idea that like smoking gets the girl. But the one thing that you should notice is between the 60s and the 70s, the 70s, you start having the Surgeon General's warning attached. We start to have knowledge that maybe, maybe these cigarettes are not necessarily healthy. Another stimulant that has a long history in the United States is cocaine. Cocaine is a stimulant derived from the leaves of the coca plants, and it was used in America as late as the 1800s as a surgical anesthetic and did have other medical uses. Freud used to prescribe cocaine to his uh, patients who had depression and chronic fatigue, and he himself would use it at times. Coca-Cola until 1904 actually had cocaine in it, which is where the coca part came from, but they decided to remove the cocaine in place of another stimulant, which was caffeine. Um, cocaine was replaced by amphetamines in the 1930s as a recreational drug, and it made, not in a good way, a comeback in the 70s when it was reintroduced as crack. So that last one, that's not a good thing, but we start to see how other stimulants have kind of had different periods where they were a recreational drug that was illegal. Um, the Narcotics Act of 1914 outlawed cocaine, which is why you started to see other companies like Cocaine Toothache Drops probably not selling anymore um, because it was then illegal to have cocaine in those products. On a neural level, cocaine blocks reabsorption of the neurotransmitter dopamine pre predominantly. Cocaine's high is due to an excess of dopamine that is left in the synapse, uh, but that quickly wears off. The dopamine is eventually absorbed back into the body, but not quickly replaced, and so the neurons relaying the pleasure messages no longer work the way that they're supposed to. This causes the user to want to take another hit of that drug to get that feeling again, and you have almost instantaneous dependence. It places a large amount of strain on the cardiovascular system and leads to feelings of paranoia and suspiciousness. So it is a dangerous drug and it's one that can cause really quick addiction to Amphetamines are another stimulant drug that speeds up neural activity. It speeds up body functions, which is why it used to be called a speed or an upper, and the associated energy and mood changes come from use of this drug. Methamphetamine is a derivative of amphetamines, and the effects are usually restlessness, high blood pressure, insomnia, agitation, loss of appetite, and maybe even a state of hyperalertness. Adderall, which is a much more common treatment for ADHD, is an amphetamine, and it helps people who have ADHD focus. In fact, people who take Adderall because of ADHD, they don't have that same kind of sped up reaction. In fact, it allows them to focus. It helps them to deal with the issues that come from ADHD where selective attention is not necessarily um, being utilized. But here's the big one. Because it is much more common, please understand this. Adderall in the hands of someone it is not prescribed to is a felony. It is a felony. It is time in prison, not time in jail. It is illegal to possess and it's illegal to have in your system. It's a felony. So while I understand that many people have different ways of thinking about drugs and the punishments to it, it is completely illegal to have someone else's Adderall. The effects of amphetamines can lead to the depletion of normal neurotransmitter levels. Withdrawal can occur as effective neurons attempt to send messages but cannot. Very quick buildup of tolerance. And methamphetamine is actually more potent than regular amphetamines and it'll stay in your system longer. That does not make it a good thing. It makes it really, really bad and really easy to get, it to, to get addicted. Another stimulant, but this one falls kind of in the hallucinogenic category, is ecstasy. And ecstasy lowers inhibitions, uh, gives you pleasant feelings, greater acceptance of others, um, makes you want to touch things, which is why it was known as the rave drug back in the 90s. But this is a nasty, nasty drug. Um, even moderate use can result in permanent brain damage. And no one can tell you how much will cause the brain damage. It's kind of unique to your chemistry. It's also known as MDMA. 
Now we're into true hallucinogens, which would be your psychedelic drugs, peyote, LSD, PCP. They distort perceptions and can invoke sensory images without sensory input. In other words, or other words, they can cause you to hallucinate. So LSD, also known as acid, people have talked about acid trips, visual distortions, detachment for reality, and panic are common. Um, this would be a drug that was far more common back in the 1970s. Acid trips or flashbacks can occur at any time, even way, way, way in the future. So there are people who have reported having tried acid back in like the 60s and all of a sudden being at their kid's soccer game and going on a very bad acid trip in the 90s. Um, you don't get to choose it. So while it may seem like a fun thing to try at one point, it will never leave you and you don't get to decide if you have a bad acid trip during your job interview. Cybacillin mushrooms and mescaline or peyote are two others. They're allowed in some religious ceremonies with Native Americans here in the United States. Otherwise, they're illegal. Um, recreational use is outlawed in all. Marijuana tends to be somewhat of a hallucinogen and sometimes is just in its own standalone category. When we talk about marijuana, it is going to give you a mild hallucinogenic feeling. The active ingredient is THC and THC can remain in a user's body for months. There are withdrawal symptoms. It's, again, this idea that you can have a chemical in your body that has no impact. It just doesn't work. Anytime you bring in a chemical, there is going to be an impact of some sort. Withdrawal symptoms, depression, insomnia, nausea, cramping, and irritability. When people say there's no impact, there's an entire reason that we have a string of Cheech and Chung movies. People do stupid things while high. It does not make you a better driver. You cannot legally drive with any kind of drug in your body that would put you at a state where your reaction times are no longer there and your decision making is compromised. So while you can drive and drink a cup of coffee, you cannot drive while high on marijuana, while drunk on alcohol, while having any other, even prescription drugs, if they say do not operate while on, that puts you in a DUI category. You have to be in your full facilities to drive. There are long-term costs to marijuana use. One, pot smoke is harder on your lungs than cigarette smoke. And that's often because the way that people will take in pot smoke is through an unfiltered method. Brain cell loss accelerates with smoking of marijuana. Memory remains impaired long after the drug's effect have worn off. So that kind of stoner brain where someone can't remember something or they have gaps in their memory, that can actually be permanent and that's not funny. It suppresses the immune system so it's not uncommon for potheads or people who are chronic smokers to develop some pretty bad respiratory illnesses. And here's recent and newer information. Frequent users are at a higher risk to experience depression and also possibly develop schizophrenia, which is the number one debilitating psychological disorder in the United States. The increase in risk happens the younger the user of marijuana is. So if you end up smoking a lot of marijuana early in your adolescence, you increase the likelihood of developing a pretty debilitating mental illness like schizophrenia. Another thing that is associated with marijuana use, but also other drugs, is something called anhedonia. And it's the inability to feel pleasure from activities that you once enjoyed. It's like taking a beautiful painting and then just painting it khaki. Taking all the color out and just muting it. And this is known to accompany other addictions and drug use. Um, it has been documented to be long lasting, though it's uncertain of whether or not it can be reversed. The worst part is the younger the brain, the greater the use, the greater the impact, and the more likely it is to be irreversible. Now here's the thing, people who are more likely to try drugs are usually people with immature prefrontal cortexes who are more likely to be risk takers. That tends to be at the adolescent age range. But that's also the time where drugs can have the most negative and corrosive effects to the brain. Lessened activity in the prefrontal cortex also comes, and so this is the area that's currently under construction for you. Just be careful. Your brains are trying to format themselves, and if you keep throwing wrenches in it, you might end up with some gaps in what it can do. There's a lot that we can talk about with prevention. Education, well, 
education is related to drug use. When there's better education programs, we start to see drug use actually decrease. Hope matters to tell people that there's no way to come out of an addiction or that their lives are meaningless. Both of those things can be really kind of damaging. So you can get better from addiction, but your life right now as it is really does matter. So you don't need to turn to drugs. That's sometimes easier said than believed, but it is the truth. Genetics can play a role. We have found and geneticists have found that there are genes that occur more frequently among alcohol dependent people than among others. In other words, it might be within your family. So if you know that, then be very, very respectful of the power that alcohol might have in your genetic code. Peers count. Who you hang out with influences what you do. Pick the people that you aspire to be and who make good decisions that want to see the best in you. If your peers don't do certain things, there's a good chance you won't do them either, and that includes drugs. If a person is already dependent on some psychoactive substance, effective treatment is essential, and that might not be something you can do on your own. It is not a sign of weakness to reach out and get help. To prevent drug use before it starts, well, some of the things that are important is have long-term goals. Understand long-term costs versus short-term rewards. Yeah, it might be fun to feel this way at a party, but it may cost you your memory in the future. Find positive environments that make you feel good about yourself so you don't need something artificial to do that. And if you're around toxic and negative people, get rid of them. Find the people who value you. And I know sometimes that can be hard and it can be lonely, but everybody has their tribe, everybody has their group, everybody has their peers, everybody has their collective. You just need to search for them. When you find the right people, you don't need to use fake stuff to make yourself feel good. Associate with people who don't make bad Sorry, I cut myself off right there. Don't associate with people who make bad choices. And I know all of this is easier said than done. And I'm looking back on your adolescence after having already gone through mine. But there are people out there that are always willing to be there for you. Just acknowledge and identify who they are in your lives. And when you need them, don't be too proud to go and lean on them. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, we'll spend some time in class talking about these issues uh, and then move on to our next topic.